Very happy to be with you. Please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 7 as we continue our teaching series on the practice of fasting. We are fasting on Wednesdays as a community. Did any of you give it a go? Okay, how was it? On the, on the scale of, you know, who was on the scale of like zero to two? It was like, you're not even sure if you're a Christian anymore. <laughs> Anybody? It's okay. This is a safe place. Oh, you're liars. Okay, so you go running, but you're not that honest. Okay, who was on the scale of like, eight to ten it was you were you were caught up in the third heaven and you're like you and you saw Moses and a lot so welcome most of you are like all of us you're right there in the middle or you have no idea what I'm talking about Um, either way well done remember with all the practices there's no success there's no failure there's no grade there's no performative aspect at all if there is a definition of success it's just making yourself it's just availability God, here I am, offering yourself to him for him to do as he pleases. That said, let's continue to learn about fasting. Romans chapter 7, page 1215. Stand with me for the reading of scripture. We stand to honor what we are about to read with our body as more than just a letter from the first century but as a message at some level with the complexity and nuance from the living God. Romans chapter seven, just take a moment to breathe and open your heart. You may wanna whisper under your breath, just God speak to me. Verse 15. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched person I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Take a seat. The novelist Nikos Kazantakis in his autobiography tells a story from his youth, he was Greek, of going to see an elderly monk up in the mountains and being intimidated by the monk's lifestyle of extreme self-denial. And he writes, yours is a hard life, father. I too want to be saved. Is there no other way? More agreeable, the monk replies with like a smile on his face. More human, Father. One, only one, he says. What is that? Ascent to climb a series of steps from the full stomach to hunger, from the slack throat to thirst, from joy to suffering. God sits at the summit of hunger, thirst, and suffering. The devil sits at the summit of the comfortable life. You choose. In reply, Nico says, imagine you're 23 years old. I am still young. The world is nice. I have time to choose. But in the story, the monk reaches out and he grabs him by the knee and he looks into his eyes and he says, wake up, my child. Wake up before death wakes you up. The devil sits at the summit of the comfortable life. Oh, how I hate that idea. I do not want that to be true. 
I want a comfortable life. I'm like young Nikos, and I have no excuse. I'm not 23. I'm close, dangerously close to that saloon. <laughs> Lord, save us. Can we do like an over 45 introverted mindfulness meditation <laughs> alone with an app? Can we do that? No. I want a comfortable life. I want food and wine and leisure and luxury. But what did Jesus say? Whoever wants to be my disciple or apprentice must, what? Deny themselves and take up their cross. That's the entry point into the kingdom. And follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will, what? Lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. And it is only by following Jesus' example of a cross-shaped life of self-denial that we can enter into the kingdom and be formed by Jesus into people who are pervaded by the love and the joy and the peace of Jesus himself. And we all know this to be true. In no area of our life do we grow by sitting on the couch and watching TV. In every realm, from health to fitness to relationships to our career to our formation, we grow through the daily pain of self-denial in the hope of long-term transformation. And fasting is one of the best practices we have to cultivate a heart of self-denial in our overall life. In our practice, we are covering the four reasons for the kind of practice of fasting in the way of Jesus. To offer ourselves to Jesus, to grow in holiness, to amplify our prayers, and to stand with the poor. On the docket for this morning is to grow in holiness. Now, we left off last week with a theology of the body in uh, the late Pope's language. This idea in scripture that your body is a part of who you are and that our discipleship to Jesus must take seriously our body and our whole person. So what's happening in our body as you fast? There are three distinct physiological stages that your body goes through. Some of you already know this. In the first four hours after a meal, your body is feeding from the, on the energy from the food in your stomach. That's why 30 minutes after lunch, we're not like, I'm fasting right now, because we're just digesting. But around 16 hours in, so if you eat dinner around, say, 6 p.m., around 10 a.m. the following morning, your body switches from burning glucose for energy to burning fat, what doctors call ketosis, which, as you likely know, is incredibly good for you. There's a whole ketogenic diet out there that is apparently all the rage. Sounds horrible, but I hear it's great. Then around 24 hours in, your body shifts into a state called autophagy. Now, in our kind of day fast, you're just touching the very early feelings of this, and you would have to keep fasting longer to get this effect. Autophagy is a Greek word which literally means self-eating. It begins to break down and cleanse your body of old, dead, or damaged cells, what doctors call zombie cells, the type of cellular material that causes maladies like cancer, aging, dementia, chronic disease. Some doctors called autophagy your body's way of, quote, taking out the trash. As a result of the body's internal processes, which God built into you, God designed for your flourishing, there are all sorts of health benefits to fasting. It can uh, cleanse your body of toxins, increase your metabolism, reduce your weight. It can lower your insulin levels, inflammation, and blood pressure, strengthen your immune system, reduce your heart rate, slow anxiety, slow aging, protect against, and possibly reverse Many diseases, including diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and a range of neurological disorders, some doctors argue, including Alzheimer's. It comes as no surprise that medical experts have been touting the benefits of fasting since, like, Hippocratics, like in the fourth century BC. Contemporary neuroscientists, like my boy Andrew Huberman of Stanford, are advocates of intermittent fasting, which is less about what you eat and more about when you eat, just for health and wellness. There are entire medical clinics right now that have been developed in recent years that utilize doctor-supervised fasting to treat various diseases, including cancer. But while fasting is very good for your overall health, when we as followers in G of Jesus engage fasting as a practice or a spiritual discipline, the ultimate aim in our heart is not to lose weight or cleanse out our gut microbiome. 
And while we want to be careful to avoid a dualism that sees fasting as a spiritual discipline versus fasting as a healthy habit as an either or rather than as a both and, still, Pope Benedict's words ring true. In our own day, fasting seems to have lost something of its spiritual meaning and has taken on in a culture characterized by the search for material well-being a therapeutic value for the care of one's body. Fasting certainly brings benefits to physical well-being, but for believers, it is in the first place a, quote, therapy to heal all that prevents them from conformity to the will of God. Put another way, fasting is a way to grow in holiness. Now, I know I just lost a lot of you. Well, maybe not at the the 7 a.m. service. You're like, no, we're the holiness people. Okay, so just pray for the next two gatherings, right? Holiness is a bit of a loaded word at this point. But contrary to the cliche, holiness is not when you're self-righteous and you look down on everybody and you are, quote, holier than thou, It's not practicing spiritual disciplines for 25 hours a day. It's not anti-fun. It's certainly not joyless. The word holy in Hebrew is kadosh, and it's really interesting. It's not necessarily a moral word. It just means most literally special or unique or separated from or dedicated to. So in the Torah, you read about holy pots and pans and utensils that were used in the temple for the sacrificial system and worship. You can't have a a spatula be good or evil, right? There's no such thing as like a Dutch oven that's like, oh, that's a bad, that's an evil, there's a malignant will. No, it's not good or bad, but it can be common or unique. So I think of how uh, my grandmother was an antique dealer And she had this beautiful set of fine china that she would display in this antique like hutch in the living room. And it was special. It was separated from kind of the daily. We did not use it for Taco Tuesdays. It was for Christmas or Thanksgiving or an anniversary celebration. It was holy. It was separated from what was common. It was dedicated to special purposes. To be holy is to be separated from the normal status quo of this city and the world around us and to be dedicated to God for his special purposes. And there is, though, because of that, a strong moral dimension to the idea of holiness because the way to holiness is living in alignment in a relational posture of trust with God the Creator's wisdom and good intentions for your body, your sexuality, your relationships for the whole of your life. And it turns out that when you do that, you are far more free and happy and whole. A shorthand way to think about a biblical theology of holiness is as wholeness. What health is to your body, holiness is to your soul. And by soul here, I don't mean like the beautiful Pixar movie, like that part of you up in heaven when you die. That's not what scripture means by soul. Soul just means your whole person. It's when you are living as God intended. And in the same way that fasting is your body's way of purifying and purging your body of so-called zombie cells that are killing you, so too fasting is your soul's way of purifying and purging your whole person of self-defeating cycles of sin and shame. It's like getting the poison, it's like detoxifying your whole self, not just so you can flourish and thrive, but so that you can flourish and thrive with God. Fasting is a way to sanctify your soul in the language of scripture, to set it apart as holy and dedicate it to God for his special purposes. And the saints have long attested to the power of fasting to grow in holiness. St. Augustine of Hippo, when asked why fast, said this, because it is sometimes necessary to check the delight of the flesh in respect to licit pleasures in order to keep it from yielding to illicit joys. 
or here's St. Leo the Great, 5th century, Bishop of Rome. Fasting gives strength against sin, represses evil desires, repels temptation, humbles pride, cools anger, and fosters all the inclinations of a good will, even to the practice of every virtue. Thomas Akempis, the towering intellectual of the medieval period, said of fasting, Restrain from gluttony, and thou shalt the more easily restrain from all the inclinations of the flesh. When you read the great ones of church history, you quickly realize that most all of them believed that without fasting, it was almost impossible to reach a high level of holiness. Pretty much all of them would practice fasting with regularity and intensity. But they all saw the stomach as both an enemy and a potential ally in our fight against sin. For example, gluttony is the first of the seven deadly sins, if you're familiar with that, which began to kind of develop in the fourth century. Because Christian thinkers have long said that an undisciplined appetite has a domino effect across all the other areas of our life. They especially noted the connection between gluttony and sexual immorality. That the capacity to steward our body's natural drives for food and sex uh, in a healthy way either rise or fall together. To make sense of this, you know, let's just suss out a little bit more of this idea of theology of the body. In last week's kind of time together, I quoted Paul's line to the Corinthians. I love this line. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is a home for the living and the loving God. But let's listen to what Paul writes now to the church in the city of Rome. Look again at chapter 7. And again, just read with me. Verse 15, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And he goes on with this whole idea. 19, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I want to do. This I keep on doing. Look at 21. So I find this law at work, meaning just this kind of way of reality in my body and life. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being... I delight in God's law. So this is part of me where I, ah, I love God's idea for human flourishing and I want to live in line with it. But I see another law at work in me waging war. It's like there's this civil war inside my body itself against the law of my mind, against what I know to be true and want to be true and making me a prisoner, compulsion, addiction, whatever you want to call it. Slavery is the word used by Paul where I have to do this stuff a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. It's like sin is this animating power inside my body. I can't win. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers us through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is a famous passage, if you know the, the story behind this passage, because Paul seems to be naming the existential angst that many of us feel around sin, where what we want to do, we don't do. And what we don't want to do, often against all of our best intentions, all of our best moments of dedication, often we still do it. Do you ever feel this way? You don't want to worry about your future, but you toss and you turn in your bed at night in spite of every sermon you ever hear on trust in God. You don't want to lust, but in that moment, you just cannot help but objectify. You don't want to yell at and shame your kids when you're tired and you're grumpy and they do that. Ah, you just there and ah. And then you feel bad and ah. ah. It's just hypothetical for me. <laughs> is, I'm just trying to get in the mind of other people and imagine how they would experience life. Me, I'm up on top of the mountain with the old monk, you know? <laughs> no. You are not alone. And this self-defeating cycle that a lot of us get stuck in has to do with our body. Notice Paul's language here. He calls it our body that is subject to death. Other translations just have our body of death. So wait, which, which is it, Paul? Is it what you said to the church in Corinth? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, is a home for God. Or is it what you said to the church in Rome? It is a body of death. I want to live in Corinth, not Rome. Like, which, which is it? The answer is both. In Paul's theology, and just give me a few minutes to do just a little theological work here. 
you're in your body and in your person as a whole, in your soul, you have a spirit, or here it's translated inner man or inner person, meaning you have this part of you that is a home for God, where your spirit is one with God's spirit. Where as he writes to the church in Colossae, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Where you're so wrapped up in God that you reach a point in the base of your soul where you're not even sure where you end and God begins because you are in Christ in the language of the New Testament. And you and I, all of us, have a part of us that is infected by a, for lack of a better metaphor, a fatal disease that we call sin. Our culture tells us constantly, any Peloton people in the room? <laughs> Peloton is not an app, it is, not, it is a religion, all right? And man, I just, I learned so much about how the world thinks and I become a stronger Christian with every ride because I'm like, do you really believe that? I, you can't possibly believe that because that's nonsense. But our culture tells us constantly that we are inherently good just as we are. That sin and with it guilt and shame are just a hangover from our culture's Christian past that we need to throw off as fast as we possibly can. But one of the reasons the self-help gurus have to say this constantly to us over and over and over again to sermonize us and preach at us until they are blue in the face is because we all know deep down that it's not true. We all know it. Or, or better said, it's a half-truth. Yes, there is goodness in us and love that is falling upon us at every moment and welling up from some deeper place inside than we are in ourselves. We are fearfully and wonderfully made and deeply loved, but we are also deeply flawed. Something has gone horribly wrong. And the beauty of Christian spirituality is that it is both brutally honest about the reality of our human condition. Now, much of evangelicalism and American preaching is wildly dishonest, but the New Testament certainly not. It is brutally honest. It will not PR you or sell you or manipulate you. It will tell you the truth about what you know. Ah, we're deeply in need of salvation. And at the same time, its view of the human soul is outrageously high, way higher than any analog in our secular culture. Fearfully, wonderfully made, a mago day. You bear the imprint of God in your humanness. You are not just an animal that evolved from monkeys to do better in the world through power and oppression. You are a soul. It is outrageously higher than angels in the writings of the New Testament. But this both and that is so beautiful in the teachings of Jesus, we have to be honest that we have a part of us that is deeply wounded and broken. The word Paul uses for this kind of warped part of our person is sarx in Greek. It's really hard to translate into English. Uh, in the NIV, the Bible I have here and open, the translation I have in front of me, it's translated sinful nature. That's very controversial. A lot of scholars really don't like that translation because it makes it sound like our essence is sinful. Uh, many would prefer a more literal translation of the Greek, which is the English word flesh. But flesh here does not mean matter, as in uh, our phrase like flesh and bone. To repeat, you are a whole person in biblical theology and you cannot separate the immaterial part of you from the material part of you. Like there's no, nowhere does your soul and your spirit and your mind and your emotions and your body and your relationships exist in separate categories except like chapters in a book or bullet points in a sermon. You don't experience your life like, oh, I'm experiencing myself emotionally right now. Oh, I'm experiencing, you may become more aware of different aspects of yourself, but you experience life as you, as a whole person. Um, your flesh has to do with your whole person. Some translations render sarks as self-indulgence. 
because it is the instinctual drives that an evolutionary psychologist would make much of, uh, rooted in trauma and survival and all sorts of things. For things like food or sleep or sex or self-preservation and instant gratification that have overpowered our will and bent our heart away from love, self-giving, even harm to ourself, and in on itself. But it's our immaterial drives too, our desires for security and safety and affection and esteem, and power and control. Not all bad, but often disordered. In fact, St. Augustine called the flesh our disordered desires. That's maybe the most helpful way to think about it. Our culture tells us constantly that we are good, and we are, and we need to be saved. My point is, our fight is not against the body, it's for the body. Our fight is against the flesh. The call upon us as followers of Jesus is to take up your cross in the language of Jesus, to put to death our flesh. Paul calls it crucifying the flesh in his letter to the Galatians, and it's a theme all through his letters. He writes to the Galatians, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, not your body, your flesh with its passions and desires. He writes to the Colossians, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to, here it's translated, your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, here's a short list of examples, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. Ancient Christians called this mortification, which is just a kick butt word. It's from the root word mortal, as in we are to kill our flesh, not coddle it, not make excuses for it, not pamper it or justify it or explain it because of this, that, or the other. No, we are to nail it to the cross. And this may sound way too extreme. Some of you are like, where am I right now? I'm not in LA, where am I? But most of us want this at some level. We want to, be, to kill our flesh and to be free. I mean, think of, there may be areas in your life, all of us have this, where you have yet to come to trust in the wisdom of Jesus' teaching, say around money or sexuality. And you're, that's your journey you're on, of learning to trust Jesus. But think about the areas where at your moral uh, barometer is in calibration. You're in, align you're in full alignment with Jesus. You want to be free of worry, insecurity, covetousness, discontentment, anxiety, insecurity about who you are as a person. We want to be free, compulsion, addiction. We want to be free. The question, we want to be holy. The question is, how? Have you ever tried to do this before? Just stop sinning? How's that working for you? <laughs> Life would be so simple if we could, just, we could just come to church for like a year, get the gist of it, and then be like, great, I'm good now. I'll just stop sinning. I'll just, I'll just go. How's that working for you? Later in, Paul, later in Romans, Paul goes on to write, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, and that's referring to God's Spirit, not ours, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Translation, we can't use the flesh to defeat the flesh. Willpower is not enough. We need the power of the Spirit of God. We need to find a way to draw on the power of the Spirit of God. How do we do that? Well, one of the ways, and there's more on the list, one of the ways is through the practices of Jesus or the spiritual disciplines. As Dallas Willard, the philosopher from USC, beautifully said, the disciplines are activities of mind and body purposely undertaken to bring our personality and total being into effective cooperation with the divine order. They enable us more and more to live in a power that is, strictly speaking, beyond us, deriving from the spiritual realm itself as we yield ourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and our members as instruments of righteousness unto God, as Romans 6.13 put it. And this is especially true of fasting. It is one of the best disciplines we have to draw on the power of God for freedom and healing and transformation because Fasting is a way to feed our spirit 
and starve, not our body, but our flesh. You see, there are at least four things happening in you and I when we fast. First, fasting is weaning us off the pleasure principle. Underneath our desire for food is an even deeper desire, what psychologists call the pleasure principle, which is the driving motivation of the immature, who only want to do what feels good in the moment. Once reserved for children and middle schoolers, the pleasure principle is fast becoming the new normal for all ages. So much of our culture is now built around the mantra, if it feels good, do it. I mean, this is a city like LA to the core. We are told that the pathway to happiness is to chase after our, quote, authentic desires. Even though we have a list of examples from here to Tampa, Florida, and back 19 times, that that path does not lead to human flourishing, but to disaster. Because we confuse pleasure with joy. Dopamine with serotonin, they are not the same thing. As we all know, many things that feel good in the short term reap damage in the long term. And on the flip side, many things that are no fun at all in the short term yield dividends for years and decades to come. Through fasting, we mature beyond the pleasure principle and we learn how to do the right thing even when it's hard. And here's the joy of it how to be happy and content even when we don't get what we want. Secondly, fasting is revealing what's in our heart. Richard Foster has that line in his chapter on fasting and celebration of discipline. More than any other single discipline, fasting reveals the things that control us. Man, fasting will teach you so much about yourself, all the things you don't want to know about yourself our unhealthy relationship to food, how weak we are, how much we need pleasure to be happy, how far we often are from God in our daily life. It is very humbling. When we fast, we realize just how much we rely not only on food to be happy, but on pleasure, on getting what we want, on control over our life and our situation. I... uh, I, normally fast two days a week, Wednesdays and Fridays. And, you know, sometimes they're great days and I feel close to God and I see Moses and Elijah, you know, just normal Wednesday stuff. <laughs> Some of you are like, what are you talking about? Read the Bible, it's in there. <laughs> and, uh, and then there are other days. This Friday is one of those days that just started out bad and got worse. You know what I'm talking about? And I, I just, oh, holy cow. A couple of things did not, it was a very stressful day, and a couple of things did not go how I wanted to, them to go. And it just, our plumbing broke, and it was just, it was a, our toilets, it was a disaster. It was just like, it was a very bad day. And, you know, instead of me taking this very bad day from a posture of like, just drawing on the power of God to just be content and happy and calm and still and meet it with stillness and flexibility and just slow, unhurried responsiveness in the spirit of God. Oh, are you kidding me? I was just like a bear. I was in the worst possible mood. And it just revealed to me, I won't go into the details of what happened, it just revealed to me how dependent I am on getting my way to be happy. And when I don't get my way, when things do not go, when I clean the house and then the toilets break because we're on a septic system and then the plumbers come through and they walk back and forth without taking their shoes on all through the house that we just cleaned and they pulled both of our toilets out and there is stuff everywhere. It turns out I'm not a godly person at all (laughs) when that happens. I am just a person with OCPD who is mad at the world. And how much I need my life to go my way for me to be happy. It is so humbling. And that's the gift of that day. It turns out the gift of that day was not, oh man, I've received 29 prophetic words from God. It was, wow, I am reminded of how controlling I am as a person and how I behave in such unloving ways when life doesn't go according to my perfectly laid out plans and how much I desperately need the mercy and grace of God. Because when we fast, all this stuff comes up from the substrata to the surface of our heart and it's exposed for all the ugliness that it is. 
and then we have a chance to offer it to God. Just God, here is my sin. Here is me as I am. Heal me, free me. Third, it's reordering our desires. One of my favorite things about fasting, and I will, I will not articulate this great because I'm still working out why this is, but I know that it is. When I fast, I notice that my desires change. I find myself wanting to sin less and wanting to be holy more, especially on longer fasts. My desires for lust or greed or to hold on to bitterness or to have my own way go down and my desires for purity, kindness, compassion, forgiveness go up. Especially in my struggle against lust, I feel a profound change and reordering in my sexuality. I notice a purging and a purifying of my whole person. It's like my, uh, without being too awkward, it's like my sexual desire is transformed into a yearning for communion with God. It is hard, it is hard, I can't explain this to you well. I could not explain why or how exactly this mechanism is, but I know it is true. God is at work when we fast and our whole person by his power to do what our willpower cannot possibly do, transform our inner woman or man, our heart itself. And finally, fasting is drawing on the power of God to overcome sin. Fasting is a discipline, and like any discipline or habit, it's a way to kind of grow and strengthen through resistance training our willpower muscle. It's a way to grow in both self-control and self-discipline. So self-control is the ability to say no to something, to not do something you want to do but is bad for you long-term. Self-discipline is the ability to say yes to something, to do something you don't want to do but is good for you in the long-term. Together, self-discipline and self-control make for self mastery. Disciplines like fasting are a way to bring your whole person back under the mastery or control of your will in order to then surrender your whole person to the will of God. The highest echelon and use of the will is not control, but is consent and surrender. But again, willpower alone is not strong enough to break the chain, so to speak, in Paul's like slavery metaphor, of your flesh. Fasting is ultimately about drawing your energy, not from like your willpower muscle, but from the spirit's power, from a relational connection to the most powerful being in the universe. We come to God. This is the great exchange of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We give him our weakness, our sin, our wounding, our inability to be good or loving, and he gives us his love, his strength, his power, his heart, his renewed inner nature, his inner life. If you wanted to summarize all of that, you could just say fasting is a way to turn your body from an enemy to an ally in your fight against the flesh. And that is why it is so hard. Especially at first, if you had a really rough week, it does get easier, I promise. But when I first started, I, mean, I was just in a bad mood for most of the days. But your body will adjust, your soul will come to love it, you will develop a taste for it, and they will become likely some of the most joyful, peaceful, grounded days of your week. But at first it is hard because you are essentially picking a fight with your flesh. You're, you're basically saying, bring it on. Let's get, let's get you, you're down there, let's get you up. Let's, let's, get, let's do this, you know, let's, let's do like, ugh, oh, I'm an Enneagram 8 teenage son I'm raising right now. He just loves to fight. He's just like, ah, oh, let's do it. I have none of that in me at all. I <laughs> love green tea and prayer, okay? So, no, but that just, you're just getting it up. You're like, ah, oh, getting that little A energy. You're just ready for a fight, right? And that's why the more you do it, your flesh is weakened through self-denial and your spirit is strengthened through communion and connection to God. That's why fasting is a pathway to freedom. Whenever I talk to somebody who is trapped in an ongoing sin and they don't want it, a compul they want freedom from it, I always recommend fasting. In a holistic approach of therapy and community and bearing, not just that, not just you go to... No, of course, a holistic approach, a whole life approach for a whole person. But always, because this is one of the most powerful weapons we have 
in the fight. I think one of the reasons the church in the West is so weak in power, we read these stories of power in the majority world, and we do not have analogs for them here. I think one of the reasons we are so weak in power and deluded by sin and worldliness and cultural compromise is that we have left off this core practice and with it this whole core value of self-denial. And it is time to take it up again. That said, our practice this week is basically the same uh, as last for all four weeks. It's just to fast one full day until sundown. Focusing your heart this week, the invitation is on the second reason that we fast, to grow in holiness. We are fasting together and as a community on Wednesdays if you're able to make that work for your schedule. No worries at all if you're not doing this or you want to do it on a different day of the week, but we together are doing this on Wednesdays. And again, if all the way until sundown, and now it's daylight savings, so it's an extra hour, you're like just ratchet it up this week, right? Can you do it? You got another sunset in you. I believe in you. Um, if that's too much, just go until noon or go until three or go till five, whatever. Start right where you are and just move your way forward. Repurpose the time that you would normally spend cooking or eating or cleaning up for prayer. And again, whenever you feel a hunger pain or a, a small wave of dizziness or whatever it is, just offer it. It doesn't have to be a 30-minute intercessory prayer on top of a mountain moment. That's great. But you can just offer a little breath prayer. Just God purify and purge my heart, burn me clean. I offer myself to you. I dedicate myself to you. Make me holy. Also make sure that you have a copy of the fasting guide if you don't have one of these and there are free digital options if you would prefer. And then we are reading together God's Chosen Fast by Arthur Wallace. If you don't have a copy, this week we're reading chapters five through 10. And if this is already a part of your life, and this is old news for you, then our kind of reach practice, if some of you would like to kind of find that growth edge, would be to, if you have the energy and capacity for that, would be to do this not once but twice a week. Like, again, most Christians for most of church history until very recently, if you felt the leading of the Spirit in your heart to do that. But to end, please remember last week's key point. And I just, I could say this over and over and over again. The ultimate aim of all of this is Jesus himself. Yes, it is to grow in holiness or in wholeness, to open your whole person to the spirit of God and let him form you from the inside out into a person of love and goodness and freedom and peace and joy. But even more than that, and these things go together, is what ancient Christians called union with God. You know, Jesus has this stunning line in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, blessed are the pure in heart. Happy, fortunate, well off are the pure in heart for they shall see God. To see God, this, this is the soul's true ache. To not just look at Behold and wonder, but to actually move into union with the most beautiful being in the universe. That is what we all most truly crave. We misdiagnose that desire as a desire for all sorts of other things. Fame, success, beauty, wealth, like a thousand other things that turn out to be nothing more than a mirage. And the way you know is you get them. And they do not make you blessed. Hashtag blessed, yes. But not, <laughs> not Hebrew, not Barak blessed, not real. Because that's the parody. The reality is life, it's union with God. Holiness is not a formula. Because God is a person, not a math equation. And he is a person who is compassionate in his very being. When he describes himself in the book of Exodus, the first descriptor he has, the most important thing he wants you to know about himself is that he is compassionate. So when you open with all of your sin, addiction, the worst parts of who you are, the worst parts of who I am, and trust me, they're there. When we open them to God, what we receive is not the stern glare of an angry dad, 
but the overwhelming compassion. The one time God likens himself to a mother is to make this point, as a mother has compassion on her infant child. Not all moms are the perfect example of this, but most are. That is how God feels about you. I think we come into this world pooping all over our moms just to be very crass, and I don't think, I think we just get more sophisticated as we age. There's a part of us that's always just, I'm a mess. Love me, save me, heal me, grow me. He is compassionate. But like it or not, there is a reciprocal relationship between our level of holiness and our vision of God. How badly do you want to see God? The devil sits at the summit of the comfortable life. Do you want a comfortable life? Or do you want to see God? Let's stand together. And I just want to give you a moment to sit in that question before God. Ignore the emotional manipulation of my rhetorical tone there. And just sit with that question before God. And if the answer is, I want a comfortable life, then that's your prayer. You do what you want with that, but now is your moment to offer your heart as it is, not as it should be. None of us have the ideal heart. To offer as it is. Maybe even say, Jesus, you gave your life for me in the great exchange of heaven and earth, Christ and us, his death, our life. Would you give us your heart for our flesh? Change our heart. Come, Holy Spirit.